Welcome. Good morning. All right, let's uh, start by looking at the announcements here. You've got an assignment due on Sunday and the exam on Tuesday. We'll talk a little bit about the exam to give you the idea about that. Today we're going to continue talking about buoyancy, uh, including a few tips from this homework assignment to get the creative juices flowing in your mind. And then we're going to do our first lecture of two parts related to something called stability of floating bodies. So <clears throat> let's talk about the exam. Uh, like I've already said, it's on Tuesday the 8th of March, so that's one week from today. And we're having it at 8 a.m. if you're in section one. So here in our normal class meeting time, we're going to be in this location uh, 50 minutes long. So uh, that's a relatively short period of time. And because of that, we can only have three questions. And generally speaking, I make those problems uh, long enough that I think they can be solved in about 10 minutes. Or if you're really going carefully, slowly, and methodically, I think they can be solved in 15 minutes. So um, my objective is so that you can solve it without being completely frazzled and stressed, but you certainly have to keep on task. You, um, you can't sit there and wonder what to do for 10 minutes and still be OK during the exam. All right? So, you know, sometimes how quickly you work is a reflection of how well you know the material, you know, how familiar it is and how you're able to dissect the problem is probably a reflection of how familiar you got during the homework process. You know, if you solve the problems on your own and you sort of went through that struggle to get stronger, then that's going to shine through during the exam. The format is problem solving. There's no multiple choice problems. There's no short answer or uh, word problems. It's just all calculations. And I'm going to provide the equation sheet, so there's no need for you to prepare an, a formula sheet. And in fact, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, I'll post a copy of the formula sheet on iLearn this afternoon. So you can go there and just take a look at the PDF of it. You don't need to print it out, though. I'll bring a printed copy of the formula sheet for you on the day of the exam. All right, so any questions so far about exam one? By the way, if we're wondering about how it counts for the course, we can uh, zoom in here and look at the weighting for the course and see that midterm exam one is worth 20% of the grade. Midterm exam two is 20, final exam 20. So it's a relatively char uh, large chunk of your final grade, but um, you know, it, it's it's not the only thing that you're graded on. So it's important, but that's no cause for panic, of course. Yes, question. Uh, good question, yeah. So let me go again to the course document because it's in our schedule that we can see the uh, coverage. So the coverage of the exam is going to be chapters two and three. And so it will be everything up until the lecture that we're having a week from, well, not a week from today is the day of the exam. So the stuff we talk about on Sunday, we're going to continue talking about stability of floating bodies. And so all of that material is included on the exam as well. So you're turning in a homework assignment on Sunday. And uh, the questions from this homework assignment, maybe one of them would be on the exam. So chapter two and three, in other words. And so here's the list of topics. And I've got a slide here in just a moment that covers some of the big ideas from the semester. Before we get to that, though, uh, these are some common questions that I get from students. You know, how should I study for the exam? And you know, that varies a lot from student to student. And I don't want to give you any specific suggestion on how I study for exam, because maybe I'm more of a, you know, there's different learning styles. Some students are listeners. Some students learn with their hands. That's called a kinesthetic learner. Some are uh, what's called a read-write learner. And so there's a, a whole variety of preferred learning styles. And, and we all have different blends of those different categories. And so how you've been successful in the past is probably how you should continue to study for this exam as well. Uh, of course, that said, some of the things you could do is you could rework the homework problems that you've already had before just to make sure that uh, it's not just about putting the right numbers on the paper, but it's understanding how to dissect the problem statement. You know, look at the words that are in the problem, and how do you turn those words into a drawing? Or how do you turn those words into identifying what is given, what is unknown, what are the conditions, what formula applies? 
And so even if you don't solve extra problems in the back of the book, one of the suggestions I give here is look at other homework problems from the book and see if you could solve them. So look at the problem statement, give yourself one minute to read it, and then think, uh, what is this asking? You know, what is the equation that applies here? Do I know it? Um, and so I think those are all valuable things that you could do as you prepare for the exam. Um, now, one of my policies that may be a little bit unique compared to some of the other classes you've taken before is that during the exam, I won't answer questions from students. And let me explain why. Uh, there, there is a couple of reasons. The first of those is I want to be fair to everyone. And so if I whisper some additional information into one student's ear over here, but other students in the class don't hear the, the special suggestion I gave to one student, then that's not really fair. And so one of the reasons I don't answer questions is because I want everyone to have the same information as you solve the problem. Um, now the second one is that understanding the problem statement is kind of what I'm trying to assess in the exam. And so if you don't understand what the drawing means or if you don't know what, uh, what I mean by buoyancy, well, that's a reflection of how well you know the material. And so your job is to understand what I'm asking and to interpret the problem statement as it's given. And so another reason I don't answer questions is that I want to see what you can figure out. And then the third thing is that if I'm over here helping a student with a question, then I'm not really paying attention to the exam conditions. And so I want to keep an eye on things just uh, so that the conditions are fair for everyone. So um, the questions I don't answer include what time is it, how much time do we have. So if you need to know exactly how many minutes you've got left for the exam, you should wear a watch on the day of the exam. Because I won't be telling you that. Uh, I will give one single announcement when you've got five minutes left, but that's the only time I'm going to be interrupting the, uh, the exam time. I try and I want, I'd like to make the conditions as quiet as possible so that it's easy to uh, concentrate. All right, so on this next bullet point, I say neatness and completeness counts. And I'm hoping that your solution is organized, and uh, that's what I mean by neatness, is that there's not a lot of stray marks, that your handwriting is clear, because I want to give you as many homework, I want to give you as many uh, points as possible. And if there is a mistake in the final answer, what I'd like to do is look earlier than the final answer and try and see what did you do right. So help me understand what you did right, because I can't give you points for things I don't see on the paper. And so completeness means that instead of just writing the numbers on the paper, you should write the formula and then show where the numbers are substituted into the formula. And I try and give you an example of that when I'm uh, showing on the screen the solutions to the in-class examples. I'll always write the formula and sometimes little words off to the side like the answer. I'll, I'll answer, you know, this is the depth. In, it, in addition to the variables that identify what the answer is, uh, just little um, guides that try and make the solution more complete. And uh, I learned when I was practicing in, as an engineer after I graduated and I was working at a company, one time I was asked to come back to one of my early projects several months later, and I had a really hard time remembering how I did those calculations and what was I thinking when I was on this step, because I had just done the calculations, but what I realized is I should have been writing the calculations and putting notes to myself so that later on I could do the same thing again more easily. Because you never know when you're going to be repeating a project or changing some assumptions and so the answer's a little different. So practice that idea on your exam. You know, show what you did, explain it, and make it as clear as possible. Last thing I want to talk about is the units. You know, uh, I've made the suggestion that in every step of your calculations you should include your units. And that's only a suggestion because I really feel like it'll help you to avoid mistakes if you include the units. Uh, if you make the substitution of 9.81 for the unit weight without writing kilonewtons per cubic meter, then you might not see the mistake if you were going to multiply that by depth when you were trying to get newtons of force. Um, so that's a suggestion, but the requirement is your final answer should include, must include the units listed off to the side. And so if it's one of those problems, a capillary rise problem, and you're saying what the delta H is, the how high the water rises in the tube, you know, if you said 74, 
but didn't say millimeters or meters, then that's only going to be partial credit. The units are required for a fully complete answer. All right. Uh, are there any questions related to the things that I've discussed here? All right. The last thing I want to say about the exam. These are some of the big ideas we've covered so far in chapters two and three. We started the semester by talking about fluid properties, such as the density of fluids, specific gravity, and specific weight. And you should be able to convert between all three of those parameters. If you're given the specific gravity, you should be able to find the specific weight and the density. Uh, if you're given the density of two fluids, one of them being water, you should be able to find the specific gravity of the other fluid, and so on. Uh, we did a problem related to the ideal gas law, where we were finding the mass of gas in a cylinder. We've talked about shear stress and shear forces when we're pulling plates through a submerged tank of uh, glycerin or water, finding out how hard you have to pull on a submerged plate in order to get it to move at a certain speed. The falling cylinder through a tube was example of a shear stress problem. Uh, surface tension was the idea of the bug walking on water. That was also related to capillary rise of the water going up inside of a tube. Um, vapor pressure was something we discussed when we were talking about not only cavitation, but the different ways to get water to boil. You can get water to boil by either adding heat or by subtracting the atmosphere above the uh, water. We've compared the differences between different pressure measuring systems, where absolute pressure is measuring the total pressure of a gas, starting with our reference being vacuum. And what's the reference point when we're measuring things according to gauge pressure? Atmospheric, right. All right. Uh, hydrostatic forces from pressures. We talked about how force is pressure times area when we were applying the hydrostatic equation. And speaking of the hydrostatic equation, that's one of the really big ideas that chapter three is based on. All of the forces on flat plates, forces on curved gates, pressure at a certain depth. I think probably if there's one equation that we did the most with, it's the hydrostatic equation. And we saw two different versions of that. One that was in terms of Z, so we had P1 divided by gamma plus Z1 is equal to P2 divided by gamma plus Z2. So that was one version of the hydrostatic equation. And then we simplified it a little bit. What was the simplified version? Delta P is delta H times gamma. Right. You probably have dreams about that equation. You've used it so many times already. Okay, we applied the hydrostatic equation when we were talking about piezometers, which is a way of measuring pressure where the tube just goes up really high out of a pipe. And then the slightly more convenient way of measuring pressures, which was the manometer. That was the tube that has a bend in it and a secondary fluid like mercury. <coughs> um, piezometric head and piezometric pressure we discussed. And by the way, as you look at this list, you're going to notice on the, uh, the handout that I'll post on iLearn, the, uh, the formula sheet, what maybe would be another good way to study is go through that formula sheet and see if you know what each of those formulas are and how they're supposed to be used. Because uh, sometimes the people who are having a really bad exam, the, the students who I can tell are really stu struggling, are the ones who write like three or four formulas that are totally different on the same page and then just start substituting numbers into all three different formulas hoping that in the end they get some right answer because they don't know what the formulas are for and uh, they don't really know what they're trying to solve. So another good suggestion on how to study for the exam is look through that formula sheet and see when does this one apply? What kind of problem is this formula used for? And so on. All right, we had the forces on flat surfaces, forces on curved surfaces, which we've done most recently, buoyancy, and then stability of floating bodies we're just going to get to today and then on Sunday. So here's a list of some of the main ideas that I feel like we've covered. And what you can expect is three problems. You probably won't get two problems on the same topic. 
And so you could say, pick any three of these subjects and you could possibly get an exam that looks like that. Now the problem is, is that you have to be prepared for everything, but you don't get to demonstrate your proficiency in everything. And so in a way that's a little bit disappointing because maybe you know buoyancy really well, but then just because of the luck of the draw, maybe we won't have a buoyancy problem. And I understand that's frustrating. Uh, it's, it's too bad that exams somehow can't be designed to be like eight or nine hours long so that you get one problem of every type, but of course that would be really exhausting. I, I guess we get that longer opportunity with the final exam. All right, any questions that came to mind as we were looking at this list? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't written the exam yet, but what I often would do would be to make uh, each question worth 10 points and so that the, the exam has three questions, so overall it's 30 points, something like that. And so in a 10-point problem, a minor mistake, like forgetting to write the units at the end of the problem, I'd take off one point. Uh, if it's a more significant mistake, like forgetting what is delta H, if you're trying to do hydrostatic equation, then that would be more than one point off. But sometimes, um, sometimes there's so many mistakes on a paper that I look at the paper a different way. Instead of deducting for each mistake, what I say is, well, what did they do right? Instead of what did they do wrong? And that's, I take that approach sometimes when there's so many mistakes that actually it would leave you with zero. And if you did something right, even though there's lots of mistakes, I always try and give students uh, a few points, uh, even if the mistakes would add up uh, one point at a time to be less than the points that are possible. Other questions? All right. <clears throat> so this is, that's, that's it talking about the exam for today. Let's do some calculations here. And one of the things I think can be helpful is interpreting geometry. So I would like you to figure out what are the dimensions of the triangle. Just from looking at it here, I don't want to give any other information about the triangle, but excuse me. what if you had a problem and you were calculating the hydrostatic forces that are pushing on that surface? You have to know the shape of it. All right. So interpret that drawing to tell me the dimensions of the triangle. If it was laid out on, on a table, what would be the dimensions of it? All right, so uh, what we have is the front view, and the only dimension we can really be sure of on the front view is the 95 centimeter width. And the reason for that is that when we look at the triangle from the front, we're not actually seeing its full length. Its full length isn't 110 centimeters because it's at an angle. Uh, it appears shorter than it is when you look at it from the side. For example, consider this piece of paper. Now you're looking at it directly right now, right? It, it appears long. But as I incline it, now the paper appears shorter than it actually is. So what this dimension is showing you is it's the dimension from tip to the top edge at an inclined angle. And so the physical length of that triangle is going to be larger than the 110 centimeters it appears to be. And the way that you get that length is by combining that inclined front view with the side view that we've got. Uh, so we already know just by inspection that the width of it is, seven, is 95 centimeters. But then the, uh, the length of the triangle we can get by this approach. Just we want to know how long it is from the bottom edge to the top edge. And we can take the uh, sum of the squares and take the square root. Excuse me? Oh, 110. Oh, OK. So did I write it wrong and get the right answer? OK. I accidentally wrote 100 when really I did the calculations of 110. Thanks for noticing that. In fact, I wonder if I can change it now. Uh, no, this is just reader. All right. So any questions about the approach in spite of my uh, slip up on writing 100 when I should have written 110? All right. So just to uh, remind you that sometimes it's not the fluid mechanics that can trip you up. Sometimes it's interpreting a drawing or doing the geometry of it. Um, 
All right, let's take a look at another one. A submerged cylinder. And the submerged cylinder is going to be important on the homework assignment that you've got. You have a slightly different orientation of the submerged cylinder. But I'd like you to see if you can uh, solve this one. We've got a two diameter, two meter diameter barrel. So we're, we're talking about the diameter of the circular part. It's 180 centimeters long from edge to edge, and it's submerged five meters below the surface. We want to know what is the buoyant force on the barrel, and if it has a mass of 1,600 kilograms, would it sink or would it float? Before I turn you loose on those calculations, let me ask you this. Does five meters matter? Does, it, does how deeply submerged it is matter in, in the context of what it's asking? Why doesn't, you're right, it doesn't matter, why not? Okay. Right. So whether it's going to float or sink is a force balance. We have to look at the buoyant force compared to the weight. And buoyant force is just a function of volume displaced. It's not a function of depth. So you're going to find so many times in your engineering career that people give you irrelevant information. So you should start getting used to information you're given that you don't need. You know, people who aren't engineers will tell you all sorts of things that doesn't matter. And your job is to sort of sort through the irrelevant information and identify what actually does matter to solve the problem. All right. So I'm going to stop talking so you can calculate the buoyant force and then try to assess if this barrel is going to sink to the bottom or float to the top. All right, so since I'm giving out lots of advice today on the right way to do things, I think uh, a really good step is to dimension the drawing. It was intentionally not dimensioned just to give you the requirement of looking at a word problem and then trying to fit the information in the words to the drawing that you see. Okay, so our diameter is two meters and the length of the barrel is 1.8 meters because it said it was 180 centimeters. And then even though it's irrelevant, I still put that depth from the edge of the barrel up to the water surface is five meters. All right. Um, now, I think it's always a good idea to do as many steps as possible on the paper so that there's no confusion on what the substitutions were or you know, if, if it ends up wrong, where the mistake was. Because if you just say V equals and then some wrong number, then there's no basis for any partial credit. But if you say a concept like volume is area times length, then you've already, as far as I'm concerned, as soon as you write volume equals area times length, you've got the majority of the points available for this part of the problem. Just conceptually, I think that understanding the concept gets you most of the way there. And then plugging numbers into formulas is less important to me than you understanding the concepts. And so take the time to show that you understand the concepts by presenting a detailed solution. Okay, so we've got area of a circle times length and then the substitution of the numbers. And uh, the reason why I do this, why I show the substitution and then I do the calculation separately like that, is so that I can double check my calculations a second time just to make sure that I put in all the numbers correctly and by writing it here on the page when I see it on my calculator another time then it's a way of checking that this part's right and I multiply it by that part and I want to double check that this part is correct the second time through. You know, there's really, there sh you should never have any extra time at the end of an exam unless you've already double checked all the calculations to make sure that the pieces are correct. Okay, so now the buoyant force, we know the, the concept is what I'm awarding most of the points for. Understanding what concepts apply and how to use them. So here, the concept for buoyant force is volume displaced times gamma. So if, for example, this was five points for this section of the problem, I'd give you three just for writing that. 
I mean, you could show up to the exam without a calculator and get most of the points. Not most. More than 50% of the points. Without a calculator. Just by writing these conceptual flags that helps me to understand that you get the concepts. All right? So buoyant force is volume displaced times gamma. So then we put that in 55,474. Any questions so far? Okay, so will it sink or will it float? The criteria is uh, you're going to want to see how does the buoyant force compare to the weight. So we need to calculate the weight. It's the mass times gravitational acceleration. And we get that the weight is less than the buoyant force. So the buoyant force is pushing it up. The weight is causing it to go down. But since the buoyant force up is greater, then it will float. Another way you could look at it is compare the uh, unit weight of the barrel to the unit weight of water. Because remember, things that have uh, a higher density or a higher unit weight than water are those things that would sink. But if it has less density or less unit weight, it will float. Now, the barrel is probably part steel and part air. This unit weight that it's talking about is for the object as a whole. This isn't the unit weight of the steel that the barrel is made out of. It's the unit weight of everything that's there. So it would be like sort of an average unit weight of the entire volume relative to the entire weight. All right. <clears throat> so any questions on the example before we move on? Let's talk about some key ideas from a problem that you have coming up on the homework. Okay, what we're looking at is a side view of a platform. And let me draw the top view of the platform, just so you have the idea. There's four barrels that are supporting a superstructure that's floating on top of the barrels like this. So what we're looking at is just a view from the side. Um, so you can see the dimensions of it. It's 10 meters wide. Um, and what we know is the weight of the platform, the weight that it's talking about is just this upper part. This weight of 30 kilonewtons does not include the weight of the barrels. Okay, what, we're the, what they're saying is they want it to be so that this platform is one meter above the water surface. Whoever's on this platform doesn't want to get splashed by the waves. So they want to be a meter above the water. And they're asking, how long do these barrels have to be in order to make that happen? What if the barrels are too short? Think about, like, let's take the extreme of things just to understand what's going on. If these barrels are very, very short, then what's going to happen to the system? It would sink. You're right. How come? Why would it sink if the barrels are too short? OK. So you're right. So the weight is larger than the buoyant force. What he recognizes is it's these barrels that are holding up the superstructure. The barrels are what's providing the buoyancy that's pushing it up. And then the weight of 30 kilonewtons of that superstructure is going down. And so what we're looking for is an equilibrium. We want a balance because if the barrels are too short, then it will sink. What if the barrels are too long? It's not going to fly out of the air and go into outer space. But what will happen if the barrels are too long? Exactly. Very good. It would be more than this one meter of, uh, of gap between the water surface and the superstructure. So the question they're asking is, how deeply do the pontoons submerge for it to be one meter above the water surface? So they want to know the full length of L from the top of the barrel to the bottom. And so what we know is that only part of L is going to be submerged. So the portion of L that's above the water surface, that's contributing to the overall weight of the system, but it's not contributing to the buoyancy. So that one meter of barrel isn't helping the system to float because it's not displacing water. But it is making the whole system heavier. So in this problem, you need to do a force balance. So you'll be comparing buoyant forces to the weight. And I think you've got an idea of the direction that this is headed in. There are four barrels to keep track of. And there's two components of weight. There's the superstructure component of the weight and the barrel weight. And then the buoyant force is only 
accounted for by the submerged volume of those one meter diameter barrels. All right, this is another one of my all-time favorite problems of the semester. I, there are certain uh, problems that I really like, and this is one of them. This one may be my favorite problem of all time. And I think the reason why it's one of my favorite problems of all time is because it confused me so much when I saw it the first time. And now when I look at it, it just seems obvious. And so I like it because I feel like I learned from it. It challenged me, and now it, I, I sort of think of this problem as like a, uh, a medal, a badge of honor, because I understand it now. I, I climbed over the mountain. If you, if you ever climb over a mountain, you'll like the mountain a lot more once you've been over the top of it. So consider this as one of the mountains you're going to climb. This is a strange system, right? Think about uh, what we've got is a block connected to a wire that goes over a roller, uh, sort of like a, a pivot point here, a pulley. And then the wire is connected to a plate. And the plate is holding back water. So the first thing that they're asking for is how big should this, how much concrete do you need? to keep the gate closed. So let's take things to the extreme. What would happen if it's, what if this concrete wasn't there at all? What would happen to the system? Right, the, uh, this gate would pivot at the hinge and the water would flow out. Why would it pivot? What would cause it to be doing that? Hydrostatic force, exactly. So first of all, this is a hydrostatic force problem, right? Because we know that there's some shape of that gate. It's one meter wide and L equals two meters. So the height of the gate is two meters. It's one meter into the page. And so we can do our normal um, force is delta H times the area times uh, unit weight and find the force magnitude. And then you can find the force location and we're really happy because it's a vertically oriented uh, shape. And why do we like vertically orient shape, oriented shapes? What does it make easier for us? Yeah, it's, we like that because then on those types of problems, y bar equals delta h, which is a nice simplification. When it's an inclined, when it's laying over on the side, y bar and delta h aren't the same. But here it is. Okay, so there's some force, right? It's pushing on the gate. And that's why it would tip over if the concrete wasn't there. So I, I want to first ask you, what would happen if the concrete wasn't there? And I think you know, the gate would tip over. And so there is one force we already talked about, it's the hydrostatic force. What's the other force acting on the gate? OK, the weight of the concrete, sort of. It's not only the weight of the concrete, but <clears throat> let's just do, let's just take the, uh, the gate itself. So here's the gate, and here's the water. We say that there's a hydrostatic force. So what's the other one I should draw on there? Tension in the cable, right. And the tension in the cable does partly come from the weight of the concrete. So if the concrete wasn't there, then there would be no tension in the cable, right? So there needs to be equilibrium here. Here is the hydrostatic force. Is it going to be? F equals T, it's a moment analysis problem, right? It's not F equals T. We're going to do a moment analysis about the hinge. Okay, so you've got this tension. And now let's think about the block of concrete. What are the forces that are acting on the block of concrete? It's in the water there. All right, we've got weight. What else do we have? Tension is pulling it up. Buoyant force, thank you. That's right. F sub B. All right. So which of these are known? What do we know? Well, to start off with, like when we first get started, what we know is the tension. Because we're going to start this problem on the right side, starting it with the gate. So you know the tension. But then the weight and the buoyant force are both unknowns, right? What do they both depend on? Volume. All right. So I think that gives you an idea of how to break this problem up into pieces. 
All right, now what we're going to do is talk about something that's related to buoyancy, but has some interesting twists. All right, so here's a sailboat. This looks like a lot of fun. Um, I wish that I didn't get seasick so easily because I think sailing would be a great hobby. So relaxing out there on the water and the waves and things like that. Uh, you can see under the water surface here is uh, a little bit of a shadow. And, um, you know, they're sitting on the edge of the boat so that partly I think they want it so it doesn't tip over too much. Because if the sail is tipping over more, it's not catching as much wind. So they'd like it to be as upright as possible. Another way that they ensure that boats don't tip all the way over is by putting what's called ballast at the bottom of the boat. It's a really heavy weight at the bottom of the boat that uh, makes it so that it floats upright. So here are a couple of pictures. On the left, it, they have similar shapes here. There are some similarities. They're both floating partially in the water. They're both cylindrical, and they both have people standing on it. So there are a lot of similarities. Now, this one isn't carrying uh, missiles. This one is carrying missiles. So how come the sailors aren't having to balance so much? You know, this log is rolling all over the place, and so it's sort of like an exercise activity. You're having to keep your balance uh, so that you don't tip over on top of that log. Why is it that the uh, submarine isn't tipping over and, you know, having the con tower here underwater? All right, it's bigger, so the surface area is larger on the submarine, and that's part of it for sure. It, the larger it is, the more stable it is because of area moment of inertia. Remember, things spin more easily when they're really small. And if you've ever watched ice skating, you know how like they're going into a spin and they spin really fast when their arms are in and they put their arms out and they spin more slowly. That's an effect of the area moment of inertia. So that's part of it in the case of the submarine. Another part of it is just the way that the uh, the mass is distributed in both the submarine versus the log. So let me show you a couple of comparisons. Um, all right. This figure B here is an idea of the log. It has a center of gravity and a center of buoyancy that are in the same part because the log is solid wood the whole way. But in the case of a submarine, it's not solid. There are places for people to walk around in the submarine, and they put extra weight at the bottom of not just submarines, but all boats, so that there is more stability. Now, here G, what we're saying G is, is it's the center of gravity. And the center of gravity is like the average location of the weight of the structure. And so the outside shell has some weight to it, it's made out of, let's say, steel. And then we have extra metal at the bottom. And so if you're going to draw a point that represents the, uh, the center of the weight, so that if, if you were going to spin the structure around the center of gravity, it would spin easily because how well it spins depends on where is the weight is distributed. But then if you think about putting it into water, center of buoyancy is related to the outside shape of it and the water that's being displaced by the object. Um, so looking at the difference between buoyancy and uh, gravity is going to be a big part of solving the stability of floating bodies problems. Now, <clears throat> you can sort of get an idea for this one. They've taken this first object here and they've tipped it. So now you can see that the center of gravity is above the center of buoyancy. So think about, if you put your fingers on a circle cut out like this, if I, if I cut this out and I put my fingers on it, and I push up at C, and if I push down with G, it's going to cause it to twist. And it's going to twist until G comes to the bottom. And would it keep rotating around to the left? No, because G is going to want to be at the lowest point. You know, G is pulling it down, C is pushing it up, and so what makes it stable 
is called a writing couple. If you tip it over, it automatically is going to write itself. Case B is neutrally stable. If you rotate it, it doesn't have that same tendency to have the mass at the bottom and the buoyancy at the top because the mass and the buoyancy are in the same location. So object C currently is unstable, but it's going to automatically re-achieve stability like it's shown in A because the center of gravity is uh, to the right. We are out of time for today. We will pick up here when we get together next time. So remember, I'm going to put the equation uh, sheet on iLearn if you'd like to get a look at that. Have a good weekend.